Hello, we are about to get started. Today, we are going to talk about differential chartography. And before starting today's course, um, make sure that you would need to update the SS Studio be because there's a revision to make sure that oh, things will work out today. And we will start in one or two minutes. Okay, let's get started. So let's review last week's topics about diffusion models and metrics. So last week we talked about different methods, modeling methods, especially model-based and also other things. And I see in the chat that um, there's a question about what's the difference between the Tesla model and model free methods. So for model based methods, you could you could view it like modeling um a, like a sample with the distributions. Like you model like the values using a Gaussian distribution. So there would be an assumption on the distribution where it being Gaussians or anything. So here the model based methods for each method, there will be uh, a distribution, a diffusion distribution. For example, the DTI will be the tensor model. DKI will be the ketosis. Um, Nadi has this model and BSM bone stick model. So they those methods assume like a, a, a specific distribution. And for each of the methods, it would fit a diffusion signal with the distribution to get the parameters. So the parameters we got with from the DTI would be diffusivities, and then we use diffusivity to calculate FA and all the things. But for model three, it's more like uh, a histogram. So there won't be assumption about a distribution. You won't assume it's a Gaussian model. You won't assume that there, there will be a specific distribution. So you, you would like summarize the distribution and adds like a histogram like presentation. Um, in the field, usually we represent it using orientation distribution function, ODF, or some other methods like uh, spherical deconvolution, it offers fiber orientation distribution. So it's that really
sorry, there is a the connection problem. Could everyone hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks a lot, and sorry about that. I'm not sure how the connections, the internet connection today will go. And hopefully everything's going okay. So just a review of what different models uh, approach here and I add the personal recommendation. So the, a, a question would be, which one should we choose? Um, and my personal recommendation is always include DTI. And the reason is like almost all methods could be applied to DTI methods. And it would, it's a, always a good idea to use a commonly used methods. And also it's a metrics and Biomatch, biophysics are well known. There are many studies supporting the approach. And also for there are different methods also offer metrics or either offer fiber tracking. So it depends on whether you want to get vessel wise metrics or either you would like to map white matter pathways. So different methods has its different strengths. So for methods, they offer a lot of metrics, of course, it's focusing on fossil wise biophysics, fossil wise diffusion distributions, and those will be your preference. Um, and for methods like getting more on resolving multiple fibers, for example, the model three, sphere deconvolution, those are good for fiber tracking. Mm -hmm. For example, for GQI, we use it for fiber track fiber tracking because it you solve multiple fiber orientation, also offer different metrics. And for other methods, also offer different uh, fossilized metrics for analysis. So there are strengths and things. And my always recommendation is to try as many methods as possible. So just an overview of the approach and make sure that next week, there is also how to interpret the results Usually we categorize a metric into either three of each um, biophysics here. One is uh, free water distribution. Another one is more restricted diffusion, but isotropic. For example, in the gray meter, there are a lot of cells um, or either neurons over there. And also an isotropic distribution, which is you know, white meter. And the anisotropy usually it related to new neuronal integrity. So if there is a neuronal change, injury, inflammation, and it's also be always strong. So let's quickly go through the assignment because that's some uh, important aspect of, of the step will offer uh, a better insight of what we are going to do for differential tractography today. So for the assignment, uh, the first set is to download this data set. It's an open neural data set called CA2. It's a spinal cerebellar testia data set, including control and patient. And the one, the data set here, if you click on the link, you go to a OneDrive folder. So here, just download control and patient. And you see here, SES01 means it's session one, that's a baseline scan. Each of the subjects in this study also received a follow-up scan, which we will use in today's differential fiber tracking. Before week five assignment last three, we only use the baseline scan, just that you know here. So once you download all the data, you there are SRC file. This is SRC file storing the diffusion signal and B well and B vector. And then the second stage, we need to reconstruct data, each of them using QSDR. So QSDR reconstruct data in the template space. So the difference between template space and native space is in the template space, all the vessels are aligned across different subjects, so make comparison much easier. Usually for QSDR, it's, it, it would be useful for comparing findings across subjects, across a, a group, um, makes things easier. So here, step T2 construction. And then we will open the data set with 
download it. So here, one trick of it is you could select multiple file instead of just select one. So if you select only one, DSS Studio just reconstruct one of it. And the trick here is just select all of them and click open. DSS Studio was open just the first one. But if you run the reconstruction, it will apply to all of them. So you don't have to write a script uh, or you come use command line, just use GUI, then you can process all the data. So here, you, you, once you select QSDR, there's a parameter controlling the output resolution. So you can see here, this has Studio choose three millimeter. The reason is that if you go to the check raw data DWI sections and see the report here, the original acquisition has a thick slice at three millimeter, but input is much higher. That's typical for many DTI study. They use a thick slide, even though it's not recommended, but they save a lot of scanning time. So one trick here I will use is instead of using three, I kind of upsampling into two. So in, in the slice resolution, DSS Studio, Studio will interpolate it. So the output will be two millimeter isotropic. And then just click run reconstruction. And we see now DSS Studio is reconstructing the first control subjects. And you will proceed after this one, you will proceed with the second and the third, and until all the subjects are reconstructed. So I will just cancel it for the time being because we already, I already have generated the file here. Let's go back. So once you have done this step, you generate a group of fifth file. For example, this one, the first subject, QSDR representing its um, the method use here. And you will notice there is a parameter coming out called the R74, R55. So this one is the R square value representing the goodness of fit with the template. So a lower value usually means like, well, the fit with the template is not perfect. So for example, this, the second control subject seems not registering well. And if that's the case, you can check whether if there is registration problem or, or either there's just signal quality being low. So for this case, registration seems okay, then probably it's okay. It's probably due to the large phase distortion artifact, uh, which is not uh, corrected in this data set. So usually what I did is I check which R square value is the lowest and then solve it or, or like check it. Like for, the, for example, this one or either this one, I'll open it in step T3 and then check whether the alignment is good. So usually things may happen is that the slice order turns upside down. So this studio could not register the brain because I the, the, the slice order is all flipped. So there could be all different kinds of problem, either the motion is not corrected, or either the signal is corrupted, a lot of signal dropout. And this would be a second kind of quality control in this step. Now we complete the second step. Then we would generate kind of aggregating all this, all this FIFA into just one, I call, we call it connectometry database. So it's just a database. So to do it, it's located in step C1, create a connectometry database. Click on it, there will be a dialog window coming up and then just click the add button and select all the QSDR file here. And one thing you need to pay attention is that the, the older matters, because you would, in following analysis, sometimes we would need to associate each scan with the demographics, the age and sex. So make sure that you have the order right here. Then set so that the metrics, the default is QA, but this 
is a DTI data set, then I would prefer the DTI is FA. And the template will be the default selected by DSI Studio, and then you assign the output file name and just click create database. You will see DSS Studio kind of aggregating all the fifth file and it's trading the DTI FA and then create just one file with it. I see a question like, can we do top up for a good of SRC file simultaneously? The answer is yes. So for example, if, if those files has not go through top up or AD, then what you could do is uh, do the same, then hopefully DSS Studio would process for all of, all of the SRC file. I use that a lot of time. Sometimes I, if they, um, if you involve inverse face encoding, correct uh, data, it would, sometimes it may fail, but a lot of time you should do doing things correctly. I see a question, does the DSS Studio have a template for my character? For differential chartography, yes. So because the newer updated version, we have mouse template, NeoNet, um, Macat here, Marmoset, Red. So I believe most of the study could are all supported here. So once we have the database, and you haven't generated, that's fine. I provided the link here. So you, you can go to the link and go ahead and then just download the data database. Click the download here and you see it. And then we could check the database content using step C2. So let's take a look of it. Step C2, you could look at the database you generated to get a sense of what it looks like. So the updated version, if you update it today, then this interface will be a little bit different. But if your old previous version is still okay, so you will see that this single file, including the FA value for control subjects and also patient. So you could co quickly go through each of them. So a simple manual quality check is that you could just quickly go then and see if the retration is okay. And also in this way, allow you to see if the effect size is big enough at the targeted region. So for spinal cerebral testia, the lesions are lo mostly located at brainstem. So look at here, now this uh, control subjects, you will see the high and the source of value. But once it reaches the patient, you see here, this become darker. So you could go through this control, control patient. So the patient, 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 control. So even for visually checking the data, you will see, wow, the effect size is pretty large enough, especially at this brain stand region. So let's go through, quickly go through, so then the visual crew already tell us that, well, there should be a finding. Now let's use region-based analysis to compare the, the patient and control. So the way to do it, open the database in step T3 fiber tracking. Make sure you go to the open the local fit file and then open the one we just created. So once you open it up, this FA map or oh, an source of remain still the template one is not the subject. But we just use, use it as an analysis framework. Everything now is in the template space. And as I mentioned that the lesion is in the brain stem. So what we could do is click on the add this button and just input brain, brain stem. And we could choose the free server segmentation atlas brain stem and add it here. Click the add button. You will see there's a region coming up. It's located in the brainstem region. So you can see it's here. Then the next step is go to the region statistics. And you will see that you compute the average FA of this region for control and patient. What I usually did is copy to clipboard 
and then pass to like Excel. So I, I can just copy and then paste. You will see that there's a reporting of the same basic geometry. But the things we're interested in is the FA value of the control and patient. So if we just put a simple scatter plot, you will see for the patient who is a substantially drop from the control. So this is fat size pretty big. The lowest of the control is even high, higher than the highest of the patient. So this is like, would, would be definitely statistically uh, significant. So it's a simple way of region-based analysis, um, but this is provided that we already know those are the spinal cerebral Tesla patients, the regions are known to locate their brain stain. Now the second step is using track-based analysis to analyze CST. So the way we could do it is use automatic fiber tracking. So let codal spinal track. Let's just choose the left side. So now we get this codal spinal track. Some of it goes to the pet posterior, may not be the codal spinal track, so we just remove it. You can overlap with the slides to make sure that the, the track locations are good. It goes to anterior pons, internal capture going up. Everything's good, then go to the track statistic. It's similar, just like region statistic here, we just click the track statistic. The same, I just copy the clipboard, pass to sell. So in addition to geometry, there are also mean FA value of the control and patient. And you can take a look of it. Similar is the patient group is lower than the control, but you can see here compared to the region-based analysis, the fat size may not be that obvious, especially there are larger variants like here, like this subject, like this subject. The reason for this is like the DGN is located in the brainstem, but we include the entire cotospinal tract. Of course, there will be larger variants. A lot of upper upstream tracts are not, are not affected as much as the brainstem. So this also brings out the limitation either for region-based or tract-based analysis is it's really hard to get the exact segmentation or like mapping of the targeted region. For example, like here only affected part of the cortical spinal tract, but it's unlikely we could just set that the exact location of the finding. And the consequence is that like including um, healthy regions would increase the variance and also lower the chance to get things uh, statistically significant. And that's why differential tractography um, is used here. Usually for, so for today's material, of course, the first one is like, if we do review all different analysis methods, say if you have a specific brain region or tract, then of course, like, just follow the same, the region-based analysis and get the diffusion metrics or track-based analysis, then that would give you the results just what, like what we did. But if we want, we are not really sure about the location or the coverage or the extent of the tracks or the region being affected by the disease, then differential tractography may be a, a better choice because it's screaming the whole brains and it's a data-driven. So we only map the location where tracks are showing the, the rural change. And how it works out is um, summarizing this table. I see a question about, can we analyze only a second or the cardiospinal tract? Yes, the, 
the homework, the last step is to um, segment it and then analyze it. Sorry for skipping that part. But the way to do it is, first of all, using track cutting. So edit, cut, or control X. So for example, I can cut here. Once cutting the tracks, and then I can set that the tracks in the brain stand. So this would segment the track, and then you could go through the track statistics and then get the results. And you can experiment, all the, you can cut it into several different segments and then set that either the upper part or the lower part and see which one shows statistic, statistically significant finding. And to know how differential chartography works, the first one you need to know what conventional chartography is doing. For example, in the seating region, it started at any five meter location. For differential fiber tracking, it's the same. So it also started at any um, five meter region, unless you specify you only want to look at he certain uh, hemisphere or certain region. And for the propagation, once you start it at a seeding region, whether you propagate in a direction also defined by the local fiber orientation, that's the same for differential chartography. For, so for the seeding region and the direction it propagates, it, there is no difference between conventional chartography or differential chartography. And the only difference is here, whether it terminates or keep going. So in conventional fiber tracking, once you start it, at each location, the algorithm would track the anisotropy threshold and also the angular threshold. So if the FA value and anisotropy value is high, then it's just keep going. So end result is that you will map the existence of the fiber track like the left-hand side because I one the, the FA value will drop to a certain value until it reaches the parameter. Even though if there's a neuronal change, um, usually the threshold used for fiber tracking in the, in the conventional fiber tracking is pretty low, like 0 0.1 or 0 0.05. So even if there is a neuronal change, conventional fiber tracking is not sensitive to it unless the change is low or the large enough to lower uh, to drop the FA under the threshold. But here, the differential chartography only add an additional threshold. That is, it will screen whether the anisotropy de decrease between repeated scan or compared scans are larger enough. So for example, even though a lot of region, the FA value is large, the comparison maybe, I say there is a longitudinal study there is a drop in the FA only in certain region that's large enough, then it will only track those regions. So even though it, it may start it at the frontal lobe, but there is not large and associated change, so it won't propagate, so it's not showing up. And only at the location that's showing the difference. So the working flow is, first of all, you need to have like a baseline scan, and then either a follow-up scan or like a control or matched scan. So any two scan, you could compare it vessel wise. So for the comparison, you would get vessel wise difference and then use the vessel wise difference to supply for this criteria for fiber tracking. So essentially it's a kind of hope and screaming and only enhance the location where track showing an associated difference. So the concept is more like a computational contrast. I will put it in that way on top of existing fiber tracking. So is it the con conventional fiber tracking just track all pathway unless it's, it's entirely gone or being resetted. But for differential tractography is like increasing the sensitivity by adding a computational contrast. That's con the contrast coming from the difference comparing two scans. And there are several approach. I see a question whether the follow-up scan should be from the same subjects for longitudinal study, yes, but there is 
a possibility we could do in a cross-sectional comparison. Let's compare one patient with a group of controls. So we will regress the control subjects FA value based on the age and sex, and then generate kind of like um, uh, the expected value of the, of the social fee for each patient. And then we can also make a comparison. So essentially, if you have two scan data or two metrics, either being FA or QA or any kind of metrics, if you can make a comparison, then you can add it to this criteria. And how to approach it? Uh, I listed four types of analysis. The first one is a like longitudinal comparison in native space. And the second type is the same, longitudinal comparison, but in the template space. And type three and type four are for cross-sectional comparison. So essentially there are two by two different variants. One is longitudinal study, which is say the subject has to have two scan at different time point. Or the cross-sectional study, you need to have the control subjects available for the comparison. And the second variant is whether you would like to do it in the native space or template space. For human study, most of the time we just have it done in native space. It, doing it in the template space is also okay and not making much of a difference. But for animal study, doing it in the template space is recommended. Um, because usually the fiber tracking result in a native space is not good due to the lower SNR or in insufficient spatial resolution. So for most of the animal study, I would recommend doing it in the template space. So that's why we have this variance. I see that, can we use differential tractography with any mat other metrics? Yes. Yeah, you could create Kinetometry database, not just from TTIFA, you could be from any metrics, either uh, even NOD or DKI. As long as you have the native file, then you can do it. Um, so, for example, the type two, instead of loading the FA map, you just load the ketosis map, and you will figure out how to do it once, once I demonstrate how to do the type two. So, let's quickly go through the type one longitudinal comparison in the native space. So here we would use the patient data, pre-process one. We we'll just pick the first subject. So first subject's first scan is here. Make sure you download it. And the follow-up scan is in the follow-up folder. Make sure you download the first subject's second scan. So once you download it here, so I here I showing all the SRC file of all the patient subjects, but we for demonstration, I'm just showing you the first subject. I will copy here. First subject, second subject. So to do it in the native space, first of all, let's reconstruct the data. Go to step T2 reconstruction. Set that SRC file. Go to GQI. Create reconstruction. You see the things down here. So you see here the fifth file generated for each of the subjects. And now we want to um, compare the FA map. So for the second scan, in order to, to bring its FA map to the first scan, we need to export its FA map. So Open the second scan in DSS Studio step T3. And go to the export menu. There's a save DTIFA. Save it. So this step, the purpose is just to export the DTIFA map from the second scan. And you can open it in DSS Studio to check whether things looks okay. Um, to check it, you can open it using tool, view images. Um, we demonstrated in the first week's course. So now we have this and we want to bring it into the first scan. Now, first of all, open this scan in DSS Studio. 
So this one is the baseline scan. And to add this DTI FA from the second scan, we go to slices, insert other images, and just set it the second. So once you set it, you will see the slice, one more slice adding up here. And you can make, see this one, the DTI FA is the first baseline scan, and this one is the second. This one's the first. So now to run differential tractography. So if you don't do anything and it's just quick fiber tracking, this one is conventional tractography. There's no screaming of the decrease of the FA comparing these two. To use fiber differential tracking, go to tracking parameter. There's an options differential tracking. Expand this parameter it will show like the matrix one and matrix two. You could select from a list of the matrix from the slice. And then here you can see the, the threshold type is matrix one minus matrix two. So we would like to set that the baseline scan, which is just the DTIFA of this fifth file as a matrix one. You will see DSS Studio automatically match the one we loaded as the matrix two. So we'll compute first one minus the second one divided by the first one as a threshold. And whether you greater than 0.2 will it be enhanced here. So now this, is, this will be the differential tracking result. You could see that there's a decrease not only in the brainstem, but also outside the brainstem. So that's the longitudinal finding of this subject. Um, I see a question about the about the randomized in FSL. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. I haven't used it before, but I would make sure to check it out so I I am not able to to provide an insight of it. But definitely, I will check out how the randomized in FSL means. Another question, if we, if we got two pathological groups, but no control group, how could we do a differential tractography analysis? I would say um, you would need to think about um, a reasonable comparison. Um, so you could either compare the, the one pathological group to another, and they would just enhance the difference and how you justify it depending on your experiment design. So the unfinished results, should we clean or not? If you pay attention to this process, so once I click fiber tracking, there are a lot of noisy results showing up, but some are being automatically removed by the ESTA studio. And that's due to an option called um, pruning here. So this step allows you, this step is the, uh, the same function as the pruning function we mentioned previously. So this function is like an automatic way to remove fragments. So you can repeat it by click Control T and you will give you larger bundles and removing those. That's more like a fragment. So give you a clean result. I would say use it. Um, and then you just need to, when you make a comparison and make sure that you apply it cons consistently across all subjects. So I see a question about comparing two groups. So for comparing two groups, it would be more suitable for correlational tractography. Uh, so that's the next week's topic. So for differential tractography, there's always just two scans. Uh, usually one scan will be individual subjects, so you enhance the individual difference. And another scan could be the follow-up or either the control, regressed control, which will be the type three and type four I will show later. Similarly, I can do it in the template space. The first thing I need to do, I don't need to repeat here, is QSDR reconstruction, which give us two fit file. 
And for each of FIFA, we would explore the FA value to set the DTFA. So from this step, you could see that this FA map could be easily replaced by any metrics, even the pet scan or either any modality as long as it's in the MNI space. So I can export it here. So, so type two is also analysis is also longitudinal, but we do it in the template space. The process is almost identical, but just get everything in the template space. First step is I get QSDR reconstructed fit file and then export the FA to make it easier. Let's go to zero one. This one's zero two. So these two are the, the one we exported. And this is already in the MNI space. And the second. So the, a good thing about doing things in the template space is that we could use the built-in template to do the fiber tracking. The built-in template usually has a better on uh, tracking results because I uh, it aggregate from multiple scans and, and and has higher resolution. So for doing it in the template space, usually we don't open subjects fit file because uh, we could just use the one of the building template. For example, here we just open the adult template, open it up. So we use this template to to work out a lot of new anatomy study. And of course here, we could also use it for differential fiber tracking. And loading the two, we just generated 0, 1, 0, 2, one is the baseline, one is the follow-up. Once loaded here, so the baseline, follow-up, go to differential tracking. This one's baseline and this one's follow-up. So getting a similar results also have finding in the brainstem, but also some something outside of the brainstem. So it's very similar, just doing instead of doing it in the native space, we do it in the, uh, the template space. And also you could see much more tracks showing up in the in the brainstem, likely because we got a bit better tracking framework from the template. So as you recall, this raw data set is from the DTS scan with only 16 directions, and then the slice resolution is not good. So that's also a good justification to use it in the template space. I see a question with the result. What is the best way to know which trick these are? Well, it's a new anatomy questions. Um, one way you could try is you just, for example, if I said that this pathway, clean it up. There's a function in track. Um, sorry, is track is a linear and recognize. Um, you would give a suggestion that say, okay, this is quarter point time or either it's quarter spinal, but you would need to just still identify it based on your anatomy. Um, this only give you a reference. So we just quickly go through the type one and type two, and you may wonder how to do it for a lot of different subjects. So I also attach the command line here. So I would test it days ago. So you should work out and you need to see how things, especially the wildcard simple here, allow you to just using one command and you don't have to write a full loop in the script. Um, it makes things much easier for you. And also here, if you, if you see this wildcard symbol, you will replace the following. So for example, if this symbol represent all different subjects and it will be applied to the, the same. So it's more like a variable that could be applied and you don't have to write a full loop for, this, for using the command line. So for many subjects, uh, I see questions. Um, 
doing it a good could you do it by creating a kind of Tomoshi database for time one and a different one for time two going through these steps? Um, I haven't tried it before, but could be something doable. Um, but easier would be that you if a nifty file save that just like what I did, then you won't easily get messed up. Because I say if you have a hundred subjects, once you load that load in the kind of database, all 100 subjects maps are crowded in the slice menu and selecting that will also give you a headache. So if you have multiple subjects, probably still using command line or using just the console mode. So what I usually did, I, I don't even open the terminal. I could just code in the console mode here. Make sure you set the correct directory. So for example, I can set the directory to the certain directory and just copy this command and paste it here. And then you would DSS2 will run it. So for multiple subjects, well, at some points, I would say you still need to do use the command line. I see a question. So you have different results for each pair, which you average across those pairs. Um, I would say it depends on how you want to approach it and also depend on the disease. Certain disease would have different location of finding, for example, like stroke, le stroke regions. The stroke location could be on different location. Of course, you should not average those. But for like this case, if you assume that the subjects finding or lesions or neural change are all consistent, then you could reasonably average that or just aggregating them. So for aggregating then it's easier to do in the template because you could just open the template and then load all the results all together. For example, I have, if we see uh, the type two in template, this one is I, did it several days ago for each of the subjects using command line. And what I could do is just, I can select all of the track and then load it in. I can just show all of the results here. And then see what the overall finding is located or either just look at each of them. And then of course I can quantify the volume and then see um, whether it correlated with neuropsychologism. So we, we covered the longitudinal. Another big section is the cross-sectional comparison. So to work out a cross-sectional comparison, of course, the challenge is we cannot just do a simple one-to-one -one com compare um, because usually we, we will have a group of controls and the control may have different age or sex and also other demographic. So ideally, we would need to regress the control data so that you would provide a matched um, DTI-FA that just for these subjects. So to do it, of course, we would need a control, a group of control data. And here it's the chronotomacy database, including only the control. So the link here I provided. So you see here is only the control. And if you check it in the step C2, Then you will see that the step C2, this database already have age and sets including in, and also the control here. Those are the data like will offer as a regression to match specific subject. So say for example, the sub, the patient we have here, patient number one, we have patient number one being a male of 58 year old, then this database will use regression to create a matched 58 year old male FA man. So how to do it? Well, one way you could do it is you could do it here. In step C2, you open this control only database and make sure that you have demographic here or either you can open the demographic, the formats including the documentation. And you can save regress image and then you could just input 50A, 
male. So 50A, I use a space or tab one, that means male. And click OK. Then you would save a matched DTI. So let's see, let's say the crest. So it's called more like creating a dummy or like kind of a regressed FA map just for these subjects. And we could use it for the comparison, just like where we did either in the native space or the template space. And you need to pay attention that this map is in the MNI space. And for type three, if you want to do it in the native space, there's a slightly different. So for example, we can open patient number one, baseline scan in its subject space. Now we would like to insert the other image, but regress image is in M and space. So instead of in the first one, we choose the second one. The difference is that like if you choose a second one, DSS Studio know that the image you loaded is in the MNI space and will apply normalization. So you could click on here. Once you select it, you will see DSS Studio running normalization because it, you tell it that, well, it's in the MNI space and then regress it and map it. So you see how the alignment. Once you have it, of course, you can do it, it differential tracking. Use the regress one, which will be the regress control minus the one of this subject and click up the tracking. You would see a huge difference here. Almost all the cerebellum tracks being destroyed. So that's usually for this study, the cross-sectional finding is much more substantial because I assuming that those patients are more day space, the stage patients, you will see a lot of track being damaged here and also the motor. Of course, there are also other tracks outside this um, brain stand. To do it in the template space, similarly, open the, the adult template in DSS Studio. We could open the one we generated. Uh, this one is a QSDR baseline. And then the second one, we use the regress one and doing the same. So the regress one representing the control. And this one is a baseline scan and doing the same. So you see that it, there's substantially more findings because the tracking framework provided by the template is much better. Um, allow you to do all, the, all of these things. So I also provide a comment line. So for differential tracking, the key here is you need to do it for each subject. Of course, you can do it in a GUI if there's just 10 or 20 subjects, do it one by one. But if a multiple subject, consider using the comment line and then make sure you generate tracks for each, each of the subjects. So the difference between the, I see the inner questions here. One is absolute difference. And another one is percentage difference. So the default is a percentage difference. So we don't have to care about the units. Um, but of course you can experiment. So this one is absolute difference of the FA. So I would say FA dropped more than 0.1. It should still give consistent result, but just on different units. Uh, one is percentage, one is the FA value. Any questions here? No, so the last three minutes, I will talk about how to test the results. So one key question about differential tracking is you will always get a difference, whether it being a, a random comparison or just like you just any pick any two scan data, even just a scan 10 minutes apart, they will always 
be different. So how to test the results will be the key. So here comes an idea. We call it a, a control setting or the chain setting. So the way to do it is like we need to compare, we need to apply the same processing step for all the scan. So we were assuming that well, hopefully that for in in the patients, we, the finding will be a lot. But if we do the same for the control subjects, there won't be any of the of the tracks. So that's the idea of the the chain settings. For example, if we compared patients based on with a follow up, and then we see a lot of tracks and we say, "Wow, are they real?" Then what we could do is that we could just pick up a control subject, and then doing the same. And if the same processing pipeline only give very few tracks, then this two ratio would tell us whether our results are reliable and it turned out to be the false discovery rate. So for example, if we just randomly pick a control healthy subjects and we still get a lot of the results, then probably the threshold is not large enough. Probably all of the finding we pick up is just a systematic noise. So these two ratio will be very close to one. That means the false discovery rate will be almost 100%. But if our setting is optimized enough, and then for the patient scan, once we make comparison, there's a lot of finding, but if we you apply the same to the control, then there's no finding, then the FDR value will be very low. Then usually we use 0 0.05 as a threshold. And if you, if you have multiple patients, you could aggregate um, all of the tracks. Uh, here, the tracks, I would suggest using the volume because the uh, track counts usually does not really matter much. Um, it, it also depends on the fiber tracking parameter. So usually I would aggregate what's the track volume from the scan. And what you could do is you could either quantify it in the template space or in the subject space. And the way to quantify it is once you get the results, you could go to the, for example, if we, if we choose just the results here, for example, this is a cross sectional comparison. Once you got those tracks, you go to the track statistics, and then there will be a volume matrix coming up that allow you to make a comparison. So the shame scan, depending on how the definition of shame, the shame, the idea is you control a factor. Um, so for this study, the shame scan will be control subjects or healthy subjects based on and healthy subjects follow up. Of course, there is another shame setting in um, in the original paper of differential tracking is if you don't have the control subjects and you only have patients. Then another way to do the chain setting is you flip the follow-up with the baseline, assuming that, well, the disease will cause a decrease on that source of So if you look at the original paper, there's a discussion of how to, if you don't have control subjects and you only have patients based on follow-up, you could still work out a chain setting. But there's uh, just one scenario, there's all different way. It's more like a logical thinking of what's the what is the control, and and that also implies what's the null hypothesis of your study. So the assignment this week is like to how could work out the FDR estimation using differential tracking. Um, you could do choose either longitudinal study or cross-sectional study. So the idea is that you apply the same approach apply the same pipeline to patient and also the control ideally you should get a lot of finding from the patients but only very few finding from the healthy control and the volume of the finding the ratio is the fdr any question here i will stay longer uh, the course will be started now and um, feel free to log off if you don't have questions and um, if you have any questions even from other weeks or 
or you, if you want to have me check your data, feel free to stay. And thank you for your participation. Thank you, Frank. I have a quick question. Would sure. you be able to tell the direction of the results? So how could you tell, let's say that you have two groups that you're comparing and some connections are stronger in one group, some are weaker in one group. Yes. How, how yep. can you tell the, the direction? The direction is defined by the metric one and metric two. So it's always a, a metric one divided uh, minus metric two. Right, but some of those values will be positive and some could be negative. Yes. So say, for example, we want to, um, let me see if I can. Get like, a... for example, in epilepsy, some, you know, some, some are hyper-connected, some are yes. hyper-connected. So in the differential tracking, if you flip the order of metric one and metric two, then they flip the direction, right? One will be larger, one will be smaller. Yeah, but I mean visually, right? Because But they're all getting um, tracked. So, yes. so is it the colors? Um, you could assign different color. That would be a good approach. Oh, right, right. Because you get, yeah, yeah, you can change the, I forgot. You yeah, can change it's, the, it's just a different way of visualization, yeah. but you can do it. Uh, once you, you could have one um, color in red and then fit the older, then another one color in blue, then you, you will see what's the increase and decrease. Yeah. And would you remind me where you changed that color? I'm sorry. No problem. Um, so let me, I've been tracking. You could go to tracks, um, assign color to current cluster, the color. And then you could change the visualization on the right. Um, so this one assigned or directional. Um, so you could flip. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, perfect. I remember now. Thank you so much. This is so helpful. I see a direct message about a meeting of the Q and A. Yes, um, if you don't mind, you can wait until uh, we fit. There's no other people having question. I see that I tried to download TinyFSL for send always seven. I couldn't find it. Um, it sh should be on the GitHub. So if we go to GitHub. Uh, and go to the release. Um, I'm not sure if it's still there. Oh, sorry, it's not there. Um, I didn't include it in the um, sent OS version, but you can download the Vadina, the original FSL, it still will work out. Okay, I see a question how to reconstruct a group of subjects as a C file. Okay, that's 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 pretty straightforward. Let's see how to do it here. Close some window. So go to step T2 reconstruction. Let me see if I can find the SRC file. Say here's so all the SRC file. Instead of selecting one, you just select all of them. And then click. And once you apply the reconstruction, DSS2 will just work out for all of them. I see a question, is there a normal database DTI group that is validated, publicly available? Yes. Go to DSS Studio website, the data page link to the assistor website then you can see here either good average templates. And you see FSL has its FA for the HCP protocol, but here you need to pay attention is that an associate value may, could be different depending on the acquisition. So make sure you, you justify whether you have actually mapping the difference due to acquisition instead of the, the, the pathology. That's, a, that's the challenge you would be facing 
Um, so in the community, there is an issue about homogenization that's also related. And also see here, I also provided a template for different acquisition. Ideally, if you match one of the acquisition, you could just use this one. So this one is the grid sampling scheme, which is corrected using the recommended acquiring uh, uh, protocol outlined here. So the key issue, the answer is yes, there is popular available data but you need to pay attention to acquisition difference. Next question. Um, uh, I can, have, yes. You yep, can say have it. a question by sharing a screen. Uh, yeah, sure. Let me stop multiple, okay. Yeah, you can share it right now. Okay, yes. Uh, can you see my screen with the MRI yes. image now? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually I have uh, two questions. The first question is I have my collected DWI data, but uh, normally how can we decide the DTI data or the DW data is good enough for the stratigraphy of free water model feeding or DTI feeding? What's the rationale and the criteria to, uh, for deciding this kind of quality check? Uh, I would say there's a list of checking things you need to go including motion artifact, eddy current, and accessibility. Um, I have posted a video in the YouTube channel because I you could just follow them. Um, so if you go to YouTube and search DSS Studio, there's like a specific video about DTI troubleshooting. Um, uh, I wish I could do it here, but I need to need, have a good data set. And then, and then it, there, there is a list of things you need to check that B table, artifacts, and all the things. Uh, okay. But I mean, can I just uh, show my image very quickly so that you can maybe roughly decide if this image is okay? For yeah, sure, sure. Time. You can just show the raw uh, data. I, I could uh, I just point out what I can see here. Uh, okay. Yes. Now I'm using the ATK snap, it's much here. Okay, so oh, this, is, okay, I will this one, check the P value one by one. Yeah. Yeah, see the, the quality seems good, mm -hmm. except for the slice is thick, thicker, much thicker. So you see the slice resolution is much lower. There will be a problem for fiber tracking, but in uh, uh, sorry, the quality it, things it, okay. I see the DWI yeah, quality. It, okay. It will be a problem for the stratigraphy, or it's not a problem. It is, but there's a solution in DSS Studio. You could regrid it into like two millimeter resolution. Oh, like uh, you edit manual has it. So, um, if you go to the edit manual of Stat T two, there's a um, resample to two millimeter. Mm -hmm. Then that would partially handle it. And actually, for the data set we used in today's course, the SCA2, it also has a thicker slice, a three millimeter, whereas the impact is two. And the, and the preprocess step I did is I resampled that to two millimeter. Okay. And for example, the vocal size for the current uh, DWI image is one. Yeah, four yeah. Four. In your case, it's even lower, it's like four millimeter. So it's like, I would say, it's mm -hmm. not looking good, um, but you could still give it a try. Mm -hmm. You could still give it a try. The impact is very high, the 1.7, but the, the through plane is, yeah. You mean the Z axis should be much lower? I mean, I, the, the, be, the best would be like two, two by two by two by two. Oh, Isotropic okay. would be the ideal. So you, you won't have orienta orientation bias. Oh, um, okay. Otherwise, like if there is, a lesion in the z directions like for mm -hmm. example if there is a thread going up and down and mm -hmm. there's a lesion then on, you only have four millimeter resolution on it mm -hmm. and they also depend on your head position if like the subject head is tilted forward 
Mm -hmm. then the, the sensitivity to that lesion also changed. So you also have consistency problem using non-isotropic slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the isotropic voxocytes is always- I would the, recommend it, yeah, but it's yeah. not like a, the end. You could still regret it, but just having things in mind that, well, there's a limitation. Mm, okay, and maybe one relevant question, for example, um, if I, I mean, in, in the future, uh, I would like to calculate, for example, the, the free water matrix. Uh, shall we also use the same rationale or criteria to do the, all the pre I mean, pre-processing? My experience is like for DTI data set, a lot of people think it's not good enough for modeling free water. Um, mm. Even though you could just compare the B, B0 is a free water map, if I could say that, but if the free water is not partially restricted, sometimes we call it hindered water, then DTI is not able to map it. So there's a capability of free water mapping, but it's not ideal. Some people have strong opinion on it, uh, some may not, depending on things. But if you can, that you could have very precise free water, free water mapping for DTI, sometimes you will get a, a critical reviewer for your yeah. study. So you mean the requirements for the uh, free water model fitting should it be, uh, I can say that- To be value, higher. Shell, uh, or your DSI. So if you have different B value, then mm. that's the that's a way you can tell the difference between restricted and non-restricted diffusion. Um, but here for DTI, essentially you also have two B value, but one is B0, one is non B0. So mm -hmm. you could say, well, I can map some of the free water. Yes, because you have B0, but anything between B0 and your B, other B value, you, you are not able to map it. So for hinder or restricted diffusion, you have no way to tell it apart. Mm -hmm. I would say partially free water. If you say, for example, if you have a brain tumor study, there's uh, vessel journey edema. It's not pure free water. It's partially hindered by the tissue, but it's still kind of a edematous condition. Then DTI is not able to get it right. Mm, okay, thanks. Really appreciate. So I will see if there's other question questions coming up. I see a question from Jin Xu. I have a question about correction. Do we need to collect a different set of data using reverse? Um, let me see here. Reverse phase encoding for it. Is it going for all the scan? Yes. Nowadays, uh, if you have newly acquired DWI data, uh, at least one B0 is enough, but not a full set of it. So you would just need several seconds. It's not the entire like 10 minute scan or 20 minute scan. So usually, usually right now, the standard approach is like, even if you use DTI, you still need to have additional B0 acquired at opposite phase encoding direction. Then you can use top and eddy. That, that's a minimum requirement. I see another question. Is GQI the deconstruction method in the deconstruction steps? Um, I'm not sure if you get us, if I'm not sure if I get your question right. So you could have GQI here, QSDR here. So they, those are the reconstruction method. One for the native space, one for the template space. If not clear, feel free to ask question. Next one, is there a minimum sample size or recommended sample size required for differential tracking in a cross-sessional study? That depends depends on the, the control size. So for the patient, you only need one patient data, right? And it, but for the control, it depends on the regression model. For most of the linear regression, if we just consider age and sex, I would say that five or six or seven is the minimum to fit a regression, um, but of course, the more the better. Um, so that's more like a statistics problem. And also depending on your uh, control subjects, 
uh, the variation due to different demographics. Um, ideally, you, you would need to have um, control matching your patient. If, if the matching is good, then you don't really need a lot of control. Um, so that also depends on individual difference and the demographics. Next question, I have an autistic subjects, those who receive intervention and those who doesn't receive intervention. So there are two time points. Can we do that? Yes, here, the same as uh, SCA2. The control is the patients without intervention and the study group is the one with intervention. So it's a case control study. It's just do the same. That's why we laying out today for the um, differential fiber tracking. So the, the experiment setting will be the same. So we check the pre-process data. Also there's a session one that's for the baseline and also the follow-up. We also have control and patient. You also have the same. So your study setting up is the same. You can literally have all these four types of analysis available. Next, next question. When we have a poor acquisition database, big size, low is there, is there an analysis we could we should avoid? I would say most of the analysis is still good. Um, it depends on how you how you handle each of them. For example, for a big slice, big thick slack, if I would put it, you need to resample it to isotropic. So this will be critical for you. Make sure that you sample to isotropic to uh, handle part of it. I would I won't say it's a perfect solution, but at least it, it handles some of it. Um, and also for motion or quadratic problem, the AD corrections will handle part of it. So if your processing goes through AD and also have resembled to isotropic, I would say 100% uh, most of the time, I would almost say 100% 90% of the time, you should be good. I say, is there a metric more robust and should be preferred? Um, if involved, in, I will. I will say there is one that's the best. Um, I would suggest you go to the DSS Studio website. There's a page about how to interpret those metrics. Some is more specific. Some is more sensitive. So I would say they have different strengths. In terms of robust, I would say most of them are very robust. Um, on on as long as you use it in the right way. Uh, for example, if you have a very complicated model, but if you don't have enough sampling direction, essentially that's not using using the method in the right way, then it's not going to work out. For example, in week five's topic, there's a different model. And say, for example, the naughty here requires more than two P value, but if your data set only have one p-value, then the result you got would not be robust. So if you use each model at its right way, then I would say all the methods are pretty all robust. And that's why they, they've been used by all different other studies. Questions here? I will stay longer. Um, any other question? If not, I probably will end the sessions here. Um, and I recall there is a participant. Um, Veta, you have you would like to.
me every good day. I'll be sending you in a direct message of the uh, another room link, so you could join. Okay, that that sounds good. Thank you. Oh, let me send it to you. You should be able to get the the link. Um. Yeah, I I received it. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you for your participation. Uh, heading to another uh to the um another room doing sections. Thank you.